name is William. I'm going to be your tour guide and also your historian today for our resort, Disney's Old Key West Resort, and our Island of Conflux. Now, how many of you have never been to this resort before? This is like your first visit here. Perfect. She's got the button too. Uh, so, the rest of you, how many of you have been here more times than you have? Uh, excellent. Okay, so uh, we're about half and half, literally, today. Uh, well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming here uh, today. So, Derek guests to keep coming back many years. Uh, now, for everyone here, do any of you know what year did this resort first open up? Anyone know? <coughs> Walt Disney World was in 71, but... 92. Close. 91. 91. We opened oh, up December 20th, 1991, was when this property opened up. Now, when this resort first opened up, we had a very different name than what we have today. Do any of you know what the original name was? Yes. Yeah. What's that? It was a very simple name. Think about what it is. DVC Resort. The Disney Vacation Club Resort. That's what it was called. Uh, um, the reason why we had that very simple name is because we thought we were going to be the only one. It was, it was very much an experiment to see how well Vacation Club would do, and I think it was a success. So as they decided to expand, in 1996, we changed our name to Disney's Old Key West Resort. And the name was to reflect the theming that the resort has always had of the Florida Keys. But we are the Florida Keys in the early 1900s. And back then, life was very different than the Florida Keys of today. Have any of you been to the Florida Keys before? You have? Okay, you have? Over here, no? Okay. Well, um, how would you describe the Keys since they've never been there? What is it like? It's a quiet town. Very quiet, okay. Busy night. Yeah, very busy nightlife. Um, what about the people there? What are they like? Oh, super friendly. Very friendly. They are very friendly. Uh, you also <laughs> often hear that they're very laid back, um, eclectic. It's a very tropical environment. Uh, and a lot of that goes back to when Key West was first uh, starting out in the 1800s. Uh, because back then, uh, most of the people who ended up there on the island of Key West had ended up there accidentally because they had been shipwrecked. So the mm -hmm. original people on on the island of Kiwis were actually there because of being uh, shipwrecked and so what would happen is they would just kind of make do with whatever was on the island so if you remember that TV show Gilligan's Island uh, it is factually correct so just you know uh, so uh, what they would do is they would like use coconuts to make you know all sorts of things uh, they would they would fish uh, to make money uh, they would harvest sponges they would hunt turtles uh, and so there are different things that they would do to just kind of make a living while living there uh, on, on that island. So life is, like I said, very different, and that's one of the reasons why it's so laid back. Now, things changed, though, in the year 1912, because in 1912, there now becomes three forms of transportation that you can purposely take to travel to Key West. Do any of you know what those three forms of transportation are? What, today? Uh, back in 1912. Bicycle. Railroad. Yes, that's the big one. It had to be a boat. There's a boat. And horse and buggy? No. Bicycle. No. It's right in that case there. Oh, the planes that you see. Yeah. Oh. So they're like those sea planes that can land on the water. Oh. Um, and of course, uh, boats. But the big one that we're going to be talking about is the train. And you can see the train in that case back there. That is a train that belongs to Henry Flagler as part of this Florida East Coast Railway. Now, have any of you ever heard of Henry Flagler before? Yeah. All right. Uh, well, Henry Flagler was the right hand man to John D. Rockefeller with Standard Oil. Oh, yeah. And so he was a millionaire and he made his money kind of helping out. He was sort of the idea man behind uh, Standard Oil. And Rockefeller gives him a lot of credit uh, for that as well. Now, what happened is uh, when um, Henry Flagler, his wife at the time was very sick, she suffered from a lot of ailments. And so, he had heard that the Florida climate would be good for her, so he brought her down to Florida, and they found that the wife's health improved, and they actually went to Jacksonville, Florida. Well, it was there in Jacksonville that they decided, you know what, uh, we're, we're gonna, I'm gonna try to find a way to come back here. But the problem was his wife died, uh, but luckily he married the nurse, who was younger. <laughs> yeah, that's and it was then on their honeymoon that they went to St. Augustine, Florida. And this is the trip that's going to change everything because he decides while he's in St. Augustine that he wants to build something 
right along the coast that's going to now bring he and his rich friends out here for about six months out of the year. What do you think he's going to build in St. Augustine? Where do, you, where do you think they can go for six months? Florida. Yeah, they're going to go to Florida. Like resort. Yeah, he's going to build a resort. He actually oh. builds this beautiful luxury resort <laughs> right along the coast there in St. Augustine, and it's called the Ponce de Leon. And today it's actually part of Flagler College, so it still exists uh, in building size today. Uh, now, in order to build this resort, uh, what he needed to do was to get the materials and good down, goods and stuff down to Florida, to uh, St. Augustine. But the problem was, the standard rail lines that existed back then could not accommodate rail cars that uh, were bringing all this freight and um, equipment and things. So therefore, he needed to build his own rail line and build the Florida East Coast Railway. Oh, wow. Yeah, so uh, the first railway was basically built to go directly to St. Augustine that Henry Flagler had created. Um, it was carrying the freight and cargo. He was able to build this beautiful luxury hotel. And one of the nice uh, conveniences is the fact that all millionaires back then used to travel with their own personal rail cars. Uh, and so therefore they could be accommodated on this rail line because otherwise they wouldn't be able to get their cars on there. And that is how the, the rail line and uh, his first hotel got its start. So here's where it's kind of cool. Like um, this is going to inspire one of our resorts here at Walt Disney World. So which resort do you think could be inspired by this, this luxury destination for the well-to-do? Yeah, do you think? Somewhere else. Uh, the Grand Floridian. So uh, Disney's Grand Floridian like Resort wow. and Spa is designed to uh, it, it, it's it's designed to be a hotel like these ones that Flagler and all these millionaires oh, start wow. to build along the coast. because um, there start to become several of them and Flagler being one of the first. Now the look of the Grand Floridian, the architecture, is kind of styled after the Del Coronado, which is a hotel in California. <laughs> but the Del Coronado um, isn't what they were replicating, just some of the idea, uh, but they were going for this beautiful Victorian hotel that uh, when the Grand Floridian first opened up, there was a restaurant in there called Flagler's, and today that's the one that's called Citrico's. There's lots of old maps of Florida when you go in there, and I believe you can still take a train to get there, right? That's right, monorail. Oh. Go along with that storyline, right? Really? Yeah. Now, when the Grand Floridian first opened up, it actually was originally called Disney's Grand Floridian Beach Resort. Okay, so it had a very different name back then. All right, well, as his rail line would get extended, so another hotel would appear. So now the rail line gets extended down to Palm Beach, Florida. And it's there, in 1902, he promises for his wife a Christmas present, which back then all the years used to give his Christmas presents mansions. Why not, right? Oh so he comes to this beautiful mansion there on the island of Palm Beach with beautiful marble everywhere. Uh, and it was going to be called the White Hall. And today it still exists. And it's the Flagler Museum, so you can go see it. And one of the things you can see if you go to that museum is his personal rail car, which is the one at the very end of that model there. Oh, wow. That was his car, and it was called Ramblin', and it was number 91. And you actually see how he would travel along Florida with wow. that. So now the rail line gets extended once again, now it's going to Miami. But at that time, Miami wasn't Miami. It wasn't even developed yet, it wasn't a city. But because of all the jobs and growth he brought to that area with building his hotel, and then also the train was carrying a lot of freight and cargo, that Miami formalized and became a city. They were going to name it after Henry Flagler, but he declined the honor. And so he's been given the nickname the Father of Miami, and you'll find a monument to him right there in the same bay this tall little uh, like statue thing that's there honoring Flagler. All right, so, so Henry Flagler, yeah, he did. And, and he is the most influential human being to any state in the history of the United States. Yeah. So Flagler is really a big deal. That's why if you travel around Florida, you know that we have counties, colleges, beaches, roads, all sorts of things named after Henry Flagler. Now here's where it gets kind of cool because this is where he comes up with this wild idea. He says to himself, the government had started to solve this big problem that we were having at the time, and that was if cargo was going to leave by ship to head over to the west coast, how would it get over there? Well, we used to have to travel all the way down past South America and then up through the Straits of Magellan over to California. Well, this is quite a treacherous path, and often ships did not make it to the final destination. What do you think was stopping them? Anyone know? 
one of, or what was one of the things? It, there was no, there was no canal or nothing. Well, correct, there wasn't at that time. So there, there were a lot, there, there was a treacherous path, uh -huh. um, and also there were some other obstacles, which you're going to see appear here in just a minute, that okay. were going to prevent them from making it. So what the government had decided is they're going to build the Panama Canal. Because oh now you can cut right on over, and you don't have to travel all the way down. And so Flagler knew, if I can get my train down to Key West, Florida, those shipments can leave from that deep ocean, those deep ocean ports that they have there, and head right on over to the West Coast, saving time and money. But the problem is, how do you get a train over a series of islands? Because there is no land that connects those keys. As a matter of fact, the word key for Florida Keys comes from the Spanish word Cayo, which is spelled C-A-Y-O. And if you say it fast, it eventually sounds like key. And that's where it comes from. So, um, now, have any of you been on a Disney cruise before? No. Yeah? No? What is the name of the private island that they take you to? Castaway Key. Castaway Key. And how is key spelled? C-A-Y from the Spanish word for island. And how do you know why? There you go. There you go. So, what he does is he envisions a series of train bridges. He's going to need 42 of those bridges that you see the train oh, on yeah, to connect those islands down to Key West, Florida. But the problem is, to be able to withstand the ocean conditions, the cement has to be imported from Germany. Oh my also, goodness. there's going to have to go 35 feet deep into the ocean. And the craziest thing of it all is he's going to have to span one train bridge over seven miles of ocean. Oh. And nothing like this had ever been accomplished before. And what year is this? This is in the uh, early, like, 1906 to uh, around, like, it finally was finished in 1912. <coughs> This is why Henry's rich friends, the same ones that were enjoying his hotel, started to laugh at him behind his back. And they were saying, Henry, you are a fool. You're going to go bankrupt. And they were calling this Flagler's folly, thinking for sure it was going to be the end of him. Now, just so you know, Henry is in his upper 70s at this time when this is all being done. So he was no spring chicken, and he was still doing things and wanting to do things. So, in 1912, January of 1912, that train pulls into the island of Key West, Florida. Most of those people there had never even seen a locomotive before. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine their surprise when the <coughs> machine comes rolling into the island. And now passengers can travel down to Key West, Florida for a round trip ticket on his train for $2.50. Oh my goodness. Right? Oh my goodness. And this is, he's, this train carries a lot of freight and cargo. This is going to revolutionize and change Key West forever at this point. All right? Now, that train bridge that he built that goes over seven miles of ocean, after it was completed, it became the eighth wonder of the world. Oh my. Okay, So it's a big deal. And that's why Henry Flagler is going to also influence our story. Because you are guests. When you come to our tiny little island of Conk Flats, have traveled here on one of those three original forms of transportation that we mentioned. Which one do you think you've taken? That's the first one? Yeah, well, within the storyline. So I'll give you a really big hint, right? So when you arrive here, and when everyone arrives here, they all kind of have to do the same thing. We kind of check into a certain area, right? Mm -hmm. And where do you check in? Right over here, in the lobby. And what's the lobby remind you of? Train station. Very good. This is our Conk Fox <sighs> train station, right over here, where you've been dropped off. And you're going to see how all this fits together in a little bit, but this is where you begin your journey to our island. So right over here, uh, there's lampposts that you see along the desk. Those are recreations of the lampposts that you'll find on Duval Street, the most famous street in downtown Key West. So now remember, we are not Key West proper. We're our own little island of Conk Flats, which uh, is a fictional island that exists here at Walt Disney World. Um, and it is uh, never really existed, of course, in the, in the real Florida Keys. Uh, but we are not Key West proper, so you're not going to find uh, some of those direct references, but there are little nods to the real location, like these lampposts that you see over here. Now, right next to where your vacation begins, in this room right here, something very different happens. Because as you can see, we're surrounded by a lot of books, and these books will represent about 25 authors that lived and wrote in the Florida Keys back then. Now, they were inspired by the unique way of life that we talked about, that beautiful flora and fauna, and uh, Creativity would flow very easily because we used to even have presidents that would vacation there. Uh, the children's author, Shel Silverstein, he used to live there. So did the author, Langston Hughes. 
And even the uh, fashion designer Calvin Klein, they all used to live in Key West, Florida. But the most famous resident of Key West and also author who we decided to name this room after is the author who has the nickname of Papa, and that author is Ernest Hemingway. That's right, and that's why this room is called Papa's Den. Now this is designed after his uh, den at his home in Key West, Florida. <coughs> So if you've been down there and toured his home, or what's the Hemingway House and Museum now, you'll notice that he had a real one, and of course it was only meant for really him, so it's going to be much smaller. But notice how these furnishings are very matchy-matchy, and they're kind of dark and masculine looking. Um, and it, it's just kind of a comfortable environment for an author like Hemingway to just relax and write his stories. So over here, you're going to notice several fun references to Hemingway. So have any of you ever read any of his stories? or? or or seen a movie or anything like that based on his, his uh, mm -hmm. creations. Mm -hmm. Was that? Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I had to do a book report back in seventh grade, uh, so I still remember it to this day, and it's a good thing because I do two book reports a week on it here at the first part. <laughs> All right, well, anyway, um, so first thing I'd like to point out to you is over here above the fireplace is this gentleman over here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You're going to see the uh, marlin fish, right? Now, the marlin uh, is synonymous with Hemingway for a couple reasons, because he loved to fish out in the ocean. And um, now marlins can grow to be a very large fish. As a matter of fact, they can grow to be 2,100 pounds. Oh. So a marlin would be like a, a big catch for them. And that's one of the reasons why the marlin, um, oh, by the way, those fishing lures you see underneath the marlin, those are authentic. So you, he would have used something like that to try to catch a marlin. But a marlin also is going to inspire one of his most famous works. Anyone know which one that is? That's right, the old man in the sea. And that's about that old man Santiago trying to catch this giant marlin fish, all right? <laughs> now, those marlin fish um, <coughs> that he's chasing throughout the story ends up later getting eaten by sharks, uh, if you haven't read it. Uh, spoiler, spoiler alert, I guess. <coughs> but anyway, uh, that's why we have our little marlin over there. On each side of the fireplace, you're going to see some fountain pens, and these pens um, are authentic again to the time frame. So a pen just like that could have written the old man in the sea. Now, above each one's television set, and then there's also one right over here on this bookshelf, are statues of lions. Where do we find lions out in the wild? Africa. That's right, Africa. So he used to go to Africa to go on those wild game hunting safaris, and you would see his trophies in his writer's den. Um, also, you're going to see uh, right next to the TV is like a relief statue <coughs> of a bull. Can you all see that over there? Mm -hmm. He was a huge fan of running on the bulls in Spain. He loved to go there and watch it, and uh, he considered it to be like a battlefield. And it inspires one of his most famous stories, The Haves and Have Nots. It's also, he enjoyed watching the sport of bullfight, right? And he considered that dance between the matador and the bull to be like a pageant. And so he enjoyed watching that very much. Now, there was one thing too that he discovered, and that is how you stop a bull from charging. I don't know if any of you heard this. You take away its magic band. Oh. <laughs> I can't see it. Okay, anyway. Uh, well, anyway. Um, right next to the bowl is like a, a little metal box that has a quote from Ernest Hemingway. So once again, further drive that in there. Uh, you're going to see there are lots of dice on these bookshelves. You've got like, two over here, there's one over here, there's like one or two over here. Now, what do you think the dice could represent? What's that? Well, she said like, he, he likes to play dice. Yeah, yeah he, he liked to gamble. So he kind of lived a little bit on the wild side. And that's why if you look real closely, you're also going to see lots of bottles and steins and carafes in here. Because uh, he also is famous for his, uh, his love of uh, cookies and milk before bedtime. Uh, <laughs> that if you enjoyed that was quite a bit. One of the things you're also going to notice is uh, because of his enjoyment of cookies and milk, this lighthouse you can see over here, it's uh, reminiscent of the Key West Lighthouse. And uh, just to remind us about that because he used to use that as a landmark to help him find his way home after one of those evenings. Uh, his home is very conveniently close. Now, um, something that you're going to see that's repeated in here about 12 times is something that's very synonymous with Hemingway, especially if you've been to his house. Something you cannot miss. That's right, the cats. There are about 12 cats in here to look around. And these cats are because of the cat that's been nicknamed the Hemingway cat. And do any of you know what's so special about a Hemingway cat? 
Uh, I'm sorry, I did not catch that last word. That, it, what, what's special about a Hemi cat? Hemingway cat. A cat? A cat, cat? Yeah, kitty cat. Because there are a bunch of them on these shelves over here. They have an extra. Because my aunt has some. Did she? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. So they have an extra toe. It's what is called the polydactyl. It looks kind of like a thumb. All right. Yeah. Makes them look a little bit different. So the first polydactyl or Hemingway cat was actually given to Ernest Hemingway by a sea captain named Commander Porter. And he was there in Key West, Florida, hired by the United States government to patrol the waters around the Florida Keys to stop piracy. That was one of the reasons why those ships were not making it to their final destination was because of pirates. And so therefore they would hire these sea captains to patrol the waters to try to keep those ships safe as they would head over to the west coast. So um, the cat uh, that was on board Commander Porter's ship was a cat that was named Snowball. Snowball is going to look like a cat named Snowball, so it's going to be white, fluffy, and cute, right? Uh, now Snowball had a litter of kittens, and so Snowball uh, gave one of those kittens to... Uh, uh, so, so anyway, when he met... Commander Porter, one of those kids from Snowball's litter was actually given to Hemingway and his kids, and the rest is history because now you can see about 60 of those cats <laughs> roaming around the house. That's 60, and they just roam around. Six and zero? Six zero, that's right. Oh, and they hang out wow. on the furniture, bookshelves, wherever they want, they do whatever they want to do, right? Oh, yep. my God. Now, why was the cat on board the ship? Anyone know? Mice? That's right. The cat had a very important job to do, and that was keep the mice and the rats out of the kitchen. Now, because of how long they would be out at sea, the cat had a very important job to do, because if anything happened to that food supply, it could be deadly for the whole crew. Now, I don't know if you know, but how uh, a lot of pirates used to get their crews back then is they would do something that was called conscripted. All right? You would be conscripted onto the ship. Uh, do any of you know what that fancy word means? No. All right. Well, it's... <laughs> It's a fancy word for meaning kidnap you while you're drunk in the bar. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It sounds nice, right? Like, you me. You know, anyway. You, know, you don't want to be. So, uh, and that's one of the reasons why they would keep them kind of uh, liquored up, so they would just be able to do what they were told, right? They wouldn't fight too much. And they couldn't get off the ship too quick. That's right. They couldn't, they couldn't do a lot. So, that is how they would get their cruise. Now, speaking of Snowball and what Snowball would do, um, uh, back then, they used to stock their ships with a bunch of different types of foods and things because of how long their ships would be out at sea. It was very important that uh, they had enough food to last for a while. So if anything happened to that food supply, it could be quite deadly, right? So um, back then, there was one type of vegetable, though, that all sea captains made sure was never, they never liked it on their ship. I don't know. It was something that they didn't like on the ship. Bananas. Then. What's that? Banana. No. 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 They didn't like leeks. Uh, leeks. leeks. Yes. Yeah, I get it. Oh, I get it. okay. Oh, leeks. Oh, gosh. I'm thinking. Exactly. The league leeks. The vegetable. Yes. Yeah. You're thinking about. I'm soup. so sorry. Anyway. No, it's okay. It's, it's terribly, terribly No, it's all right. It was a terrible joke. <laughs> terrible joke. All right. Well, anyway, uh, so you're going to see those cats again. One other fun reference to Hemingway is this handbell that you see on the second shelf down. You don't see that? That handbell, um, first of all, references one of Ernest Hemingway's most famous stories. Anyone know which one that is? A handbell? Yeah. Oh, handbell. Handbell, you see it right yes, there? I'm, yes, I'm yes. You're okay. And <laughs> anyone know what story? I'll give you a hint. No. For whom the bell tolls. There you go, look at that. For whom the bell tolls. So there's a little handbell which could toll. And if you look real closely at that bell, you'll also see that it has the year 1912 on it. And why is 1912 significant? The Titanic. Well, yes, but also something happened with our story. They broke the train down. That's when the train pulls into Key West, Florida in January of 1912. And like you said, that's also in April of 1912 when the Titanic disaster happened. And actually, if you look real closely at that bell, it does also say Titanic on there. Um, now, you all know what happens when you cross the Atlantic with Titanic, right? In that way. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I didn't even sit here yet. <laughs> I'm <laughs> so sorry. It's all right. I'll have to. All right. So they can help me with it. So <laughs> you all know what happens when you cross the Atlantic with Titanic, right? You get hit by an iceberg. <laughs> True. You get halfway. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, anyway, so <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you've seen that. Uh, but anyway, uh, so. <laughs> 
Lots of fun references to Hemingway here. Because again, this was supposed to be his letters den. This would be a room where an author would be able to create these stories. So right next to where your vacation begins, in this room right here where our stories are created, this is where our story will begin. In that glass case right back there, you are going to see the mission statement plaque for our Confluence Hospitality League. Now, the Confluence Hospitality League was founded by the mayor of our island, and his name was Cooter Trumbo Esquire. And Cooter Trumbo Esquire was so beloved by all of the residents of Confluence and everyone who came to visit us, that the waterway that you take to Disney Springs, the one that leads up to the Sassagula River, is called the Trumbo Canal after our mayor. Now, our mayor's name comes from a real location in Key West, Florida, called Trumbo Point. And it happens to be where the rail line ended, okay? So it was a very famous spot. So Cooter Trumbo Esquire, and that's where our mayor's name comes from. Now, when the resort first opened up, our members and guests were taking smaller pontoon boats to downtown Disney, as the area was called back then. And those little boats were called Trumbo Ferries after our mayor. Hmm. Now, Trumbo was not the only character that resided here in Con Flats. You're going to learn about a whole cast of characters here today. But to understand um, the layout of our resort and also our island of Con Flats, do you remember when you first come into the resort, you cross over a little bit of a bumpy bridge, and after you cross over the bridge on the left hand side, it says, Welcome to Con Flats. Have you seen that? Probably. Yeah? <coughs> If you look real closely at that sign, it'll also tell you what our population is. Anyone know what it is? Oh, no. So next time you come in, take a look, because the Imagineers hid something for you. And it says, population friendly. Oh, oh yeah. really? Yeah, yeah. So that's where the island begins. It actually ends over here at this marina. So Complex is just the area where like the restaurants and the shops and everything are. The other villas are designed to be like on other islands in the Keys. And that's why there's so much water around the resort to give you that same kind of feeling that you're going hopping from island to island like you have in the Keys. Because there'll be some islands that are kind of big and there'll be some that are smaller and have just a couple of houses on it. So our resort is broken up that same way. Um, and also, oh, wow. our resort is it's broken up into about six islands and then we have Confax as well. <laughs> and the islands that, um, that we have are named after real islands in the Florida Keys. And you can find out the name of your island if you look at the front of the housekeeping golf cart when you come out to your area. They have the name where they're going to on the front. Okay. So like I said, it's about six islands and we have pond flats over here. Um, and yeah, that's right. So anyway, pond flats is where we are. So our little island here is going to have a whole rich history. A lot of it is inspired by um, the real history of, of Key West itself. So we are now going to begin the walking portion of our tour and see how the story is going to unfold. So come follow me as we head on over to General Story.